Congratulations, Brandon, where you be? There he is, in the back, Brandon with his hat. The man with all the hats. And Mark Moore has done everything else for ESI. He's getting a degree in environmental science and astronomy. Mark, on the spotlight. And sitting in on base tonight is, no, I'm just, all right. So you may often ask yourself the question, how can I help ensure the future of hot science school talks? Well, maybe you don't. Um, maybe you think I'm just joking, because maybe sometimes I'm a little bit sarcastic. But no joke here. Hot Science School Talks uh, really needs all, all the support from the community to help, help um, continue to put on these productions. And you may ask, how can I help? One way is you could follow us. We have all these uh, social media abilities to follow us. That's one way you can. You may ask, how can I do more than just this? You could say, Jay, I'm already following you on all of this. I'm already tweeting about you. What more can I do? Well, I have a suggestion for what more you could do. Perchance, do you have a phone? If you have a phone, please take it out. Go ahead. This will be the last time tonight, or at least for the next hour, you'll be allowed to use your phone. Please, please take it out. Please open up your email application and get ready to send an email message. Right. I see some of my students here saying, he's really asking us to use the phone in the classroom? And address your message to, there's no commitment here, this address, giving at esi.utexas.edu. Go ahead, I'll give you a second to type that into your email application. Come on, Andrew, you could do this. Absolutely no commitment here. You're only going to be requesting information because you want to know how you can do more, then all you have to do in the subject line is write send info on how to give. Or even if you just write send info, that'll be enough. <laughs> It'll get to that address and you'll receive information on how you can help ensure that Hot Science School Talks will continue into the future. We would really appreciate your help. And if enough people do this, we'll achieve a critical mass of filling up that box. Let's blow up this email box. Everybody send a message to it. All right, thanks for doing that. And no sooner have I told you to do that than I'm now going to remind you, when you're done, to turn off all electronic devices. There's no talking during the lecture. We have a Q&A session. It begins at 7 p.m. We're ending at 8.15. When the Q&A is over, then we're going to have a raffle for the door prizes. We picked up those tickets, and we have some exciting door prizes for you. So without further ado, I want to present the 90th in the series of Hot Science School Talks, The Social Lives of Monkeys. Professor DeFiore is chairman of the anthropology department here at the University of Texas. He's, uh, all, I think if I only had to pick one phrase, he's sort of, I would say he's sort of an Indiana Jones type, running through the forests in the Amazon, in the rainforest, avoiding predators, finding spider monkeys, and using modern methods such as DNA, to find out all about how they work. He's a highly regarded biological anthropologist in his field of study, and I introduce you to him here. That's a very tiny little microphone. Cool. Well, Jay, thank you very much for that introduction. Nobody here likes monkeys, do they? I hope you all like monkeys. Uh, could we maybe have the lights down a little bit? Can you guys see that pretty well? Yeah, I think we need to make it a little. Yes. So I want to begin this talk by sharing with you guys an anecdote about this guy right here. This. This is an adult male spider monkey named Lucas, and I've known Lucas for about nine years. He's one of the, my favorite uh, animals, one of my favorite study animals, even though he's a little bit ornery, uh, even though he looks all the time as if he's just tasted something bad, he's got his tongue out all the time. That's how you guys are going to recognize him. You're going to see him a couple times tonight. I want to tell you an anecdote about Lucas, and to set the scene, I want you to maybe close your eyes and just listen for a second. Oh, well, that's because I've forgotten to turn the mic on. Can you guys... Can you hear me now? All right. So this is Lucas. Did you guys hear me tell you about Lucas? 
Lucas is one of my favorite monkeys. He always looks like he's tasted something bad, right? He's got his mouth a little bit open, his tongue stuck out a little bit. He's a little bit ornery. We have a love-hate relationship. Um, I'm going to tell you an anecdote about Lucas. And to start this off, to set the scene, I want you to maybe close your eyes and imagine yourself in a tropical rainforest. It's rained the night before, and we're going to set the mood here just a little bit. So it's rained the night before, it's early morning, and my colleague Andres Link and I have gotten up really early and walked through the dark about 45 minutes to get to where we put a group of spider monkeys, including Lucas and a bunch of other male spider monkeys and some females and their kids to bed the night before. As the sun starts to come up, we hear these sounds of the forest behind us, bugs, birds, rain dripping off the trees, and the spider monkeys wake up and they start feeding on some fruits overhead and they're dropping the seeds around us. And we watch them for a little while, and those sounds die away just a little bit. And then we hear this call in the distance. It's a spider monkey loud call, and it goes like this. Thank you. And the second that call happens, all of the males, Lucas and the other males that he's with, suddenly perk up and they begin moving. They peel off from the rest of the animals that are in the trees overhead and they start making a beeline in the direction of the call. They move quickly and silently in a straight line, stopping only every once in a while to call back and forth with those animals in the distance. They take a long loop through an area, part of their territory that we've never seen them go in before, and they walk for about an hour, really deliberately. And when they get to this place outside of their home range, they space out on the top of tall trees alongside a river that marks the border of one side of their territory. And they start looking across the river and calling back and forth with the monkeys across the river. So this is a really conspicuous, a really striking behavior that we hadn't seen before. And that's an incident that exemplifies some really interesting features about the social lives of spider monkeys that have been coming to light based on my team's field research over the last nine years or so. It's an example of cooperative behavior on the part of a closely bonded group of male monkeys who patrol and actively defend access to a territory, access to a set of resources from other groups of monkeys. I want to tell you about spider monkeys today. I want to do two things in this talk. The first thing I want to do is give you an overview of why spider monkeys are interesting, give you some insight into the social lives of these critters. I think they're especially interesting to anthropologists because they're very similar to chimpanzees, our closest non-human primate relatives, and they're presumably similar to early humans as well in many aspects of their behavior, including this cooperative territorial defense and boundary patrolling. And secondly, and more importantly for you kids that are here in the audience, I want to give you a taste of what it's like to conduct field work on primates in the tropics. Uh, and I want to give you some examples of how the study of primates in the wild has changed a lot over the last 50 years to incorporate more technology, to incorporate new field techniques and new field methods that really shed some, I think, pretty insightful, um, pretty insightful insights into the behavioral biology of these, of these individuals, of these monkeys. So where are we going to go with this talk? Well, I want to start off by putting spider monkeys, our protagonists for today, into context as primates. Then I want to give you a taste of primatological fieldwork. How the heck do you study arboreal, tree-living, rainforest primates? How do primatologists actually go about doing this in the field? Because I think it's cool and it's fun. And that's why I became a primatologist, because I got to run around in a tropical forest and look at critters that are fascinating and so much like us in so many ways for my occupation. And then the last thing I want to do, the final thing I want to do today is give you a few vignettes, four little vignettes, evocative accounts of particular features of spider monkey behavioral biology. I think they're interesting and I think they showcase the ways in which traditional observational approaches to the study of primate behavior and more modern technological approaches to the study of primate behavior mutually inform one another. So to get us started, uh, I want to review a couple of key features of primates that you guys are probably all familiar with uh, that distinguish primates, including ourselves, from other mammals. So what do you notice about this tarsier up here? And I'm not going to call on Chris Kirk, who's out there, because I know he knows the answer to this, because he gave a talk about the sensory ecology of 
primates not too long ago in this very same series. What do you guys notice about this monkey, this primate? Yes. Anyone over here that's raising their hand? It has really big eyes. That's exactly right. It's got really big eyes. So primates are distinguished from other groups of mammals because we've got large eyes, forward-facing eyes, which give us really great binocular vision, really great depth perception. And primates also have very acute, high visual acuity in their eyes. It allows us to really see detail, see features of shape and expression in the other individuals that we're looking at. What about these things over here? What do you notice about those? For those of you guys who still have that little slip of paper on the arm of your chair, drop it on the floor and then bound down and pick it up. Try to do that. You can do it, right? <laughs> Most of you can do it. If you were a cat, you couldn't do it, right? Or if you were a horse, you couldn't do that. Why? I heard somebody say it here. It's because we've got this wonderfully opposable thumb. We have really high manual dexterity capable of that opposition and precision grip. So that's the second feature that distinguishes primates from other sets of mammals, other kinds of mammals. Third thing is our big brain, particularly our big neocortex, all of these colored lobes up here. Relative to other mammals, primates have really large neocortices compared to the, other, the, the remainder of their brain. And the neocortex is the part of the brain that's associated with self-control, with abstract thought, with the ability to take the perspective of another individual. And so that's another distinguishing feature of primates, large neocortex size compared to the rest of the brain. And then finally, the fourth interesting thing I want to point to that distinguishes primates from many other groups of mammals um, is the fact that most primate species live in large bisexual, multi-male, multi-female social groups that comprise multiple generations of individuals. So this is an example of some geladas up in the highlands of Ethiopia. You can see there's a whole bunch of individuals around here. They're broken up into these little cliques. They're grooming one another. They're chattering with one another. They're probably making some aggressive gestures with one another. As primates, we are constantly negotiating a shifting social environment of friends and relatives and enemies. And that's another pretty unique thing about our order. Okay, so this is an evolutionary tree of primates. Everybody's seen an evolutionary tree before, I'm assuming. Um, the critters we're going to be focusing on today are these guys up here, New World monkeys, particularly these guys, spider monkeys. It's worth mentioning at this point that these guys shared a common ancestor with us a long, long time ago, about 36 million years ago. So one of the questions that evolutionary anthropologists get all the time is, hey, do you really believe we're descended from monkeys? And what's the answer to that? Well, the answer to that is, well, of course not. I don't believe that we're not descended from monkeys. We are primates. We're part of a radiation that includes monkeys. It includes all these apes over here. It includes tarsiers. It includes lemurs, loris, and, and potos. But we're not descended from monkeys. We share features of our biology with monkeys by virtue of descent from a common ancestor. So I just want to get that out of the way. We're not descended from monkeys. OK. So the New World monkeys that we're going to talk about today, um, the spider monkeys, are part of a radiation that includes a couple of other genera, a couple of other types of monkeys as well, woolly monkeys and howler monkeys and murikis. All of these things are part of a group of monkeys known as the family Atelidae. There's spider monkeys kind of nested within this family. And what's cool about them? Well, they all share a morphological feature in common. That's the morphological feature that they share in common, a prehensile tail. So this family of neotropical primates, this family of monkeys from the New World, is the only family, the only group of New World monkeys that have a completely prehensile tail. They can hang their whole body weight from that tail. They use it almost like a fifth hand or a fifth, uh, fifth appendage as they're moving, as they're feeding, and so on. So all the Atelid primates have that. The spider monkeys that we're going to focus on are one of the New World monkeys that have the largest geographic distribution of any species that you'll find in South America or Central America. So they're found down from the Southern Amazon all the way up to the East Coast of Mexico, very broad geographic distribution. And based on the research that me and my colleagues and other research groups have done over the last 10 to 15 years, we know a lot about the basic natural history of spider monkeys. I'm gonna review that for you really quick before you go and talk about their social lives in more detail. So in terms of their group composition, spider monkeys live in large social groups, multi-male, multi-female social groups, there's several adult males, several adult females in the same group. They are highly frugivorous primates. Who knows what that means? Kids? They eat 
fruits, exactly. So that's why I've got some fruits up here. They eat lots of different species of fruits. In fact, in fact, they're ripe fruit specialists. You can categorize them as among the most specialized frugivores in the primate radiation. They eat about, in our study site, about 250 different species of tropical plants. They also use really large areas. So this is an aerial photograph or a satellite photograph of the Amazon rainforest where me and my colleagues work taken from Google Earth, and you can see it's this nice, beautiful green primary tropical rainforest over here. Each of these little yellow squares right here is a 100 meter by 100 meter cell that we've superimposed on our study area. And in each of these cells, we've seen groups of, or members of our main study community of spider monkeys at some point over the last uh, couple of years. So they use a lot of space. This is a pretty big area. It's about 408 hectares just over a thousand acres. The cool thing about spider monkeys is that not all of the members of that social group use that area in the same way. Males and females use that space differently. So what I've done here is plotted all the places where we've seen this particular adult male, Poto, who I'll talk about again later on, and who was there that day that we followed Lucas and his compatriots on a patrol outside of their territory. This is the area that Poto uses, and you can see that it's very comparable in to this area that the whole study group uses. By contrast, here's the area used by a typical adult female, Anna, who some of you kids, I think, drew pictures of uh, outside a little while ago. Anna's home range is a lot smaller than Poto's. And if you look at the home ranges of males compared to the home range size of females, males typically use a much bigger area than females do, about twice the area of females. They range over uh, um, regularly. There are two other really important features about the behavioral biology of spider monkeys that I want to point out that I haven't mentioned yet. And they're interesting because they're really unusual among mammals. They're really unusual among primates. And the first of these is that spider monkeys in spider monkeys, females typically move out of, disperse from the groups that they're born in, and they move into new groups before they start reproducing. And that's a very, very rare pattern in mammals. It's a very rare pattern in primates. You see it in spider monkeys, you see it in chimpanzees, you see it in a couple of other taxa, but it's rare. What does that mean? It means that males in a group usually are related to one another. So it's a patrilineally organized society. The second thing I want to point to that's really unusual about <coughs> spider monkeys is the fact that they practice a, a very flexible pattern of social associations. We call this fission fusion sociality or fission fusion social associations. What does that mean? It means that the whole group of spider monkeys is rarely seen in the same place at the same time. I gave you that anecdote where Lucas and some other males split off from the other individuals that they were with. Well, that's very characteristic of a fission fusion society. So the members of a group will split into a whole bunch of different subgroups and go wandering on their own throughout the day. They'll bump into other subgroups, they'll reassort their membership, and they'll do this four or five times a day. So that Flexible association patterns is also very rare in mammals, although it characterizes, again, spider monkeys and chimpanzees. It also characterizes a couple of other non-primate taxa, so some cetaceans like dolphins and killer whales, uh, elephants, spotted hyenas, just to name a few other mammals, but it's pretty rare outside of those examples that I've just given. It's, it's seen in chimpanzees, lovely picture. And it's seen in humans. So if you guys think about it, you guys practice fission fusion sociality. You probably had breakfast this morning with some of your family members. You maybe went in a carpool with some other individuals to work or to school. If you were at school, you probably shifted around in your classroom and associated with different people throughout the day. You've come here. You're part of this big association right now. You might go out to a bar or to a movie or out to dinner after this with a small set of stuff of people you make friends with here tonight. So that's fission fusion flexible social systems. Humans, spider monkeys, chimpanzees characterizes us all. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about spider monkey natural history, I wanna tell you a little bit about how primatologists go about studying monkeys in the wild. Who knows who this is? If you don't know who this is, I'm disappointed. Most of you guys know who this is. This is Jane Goodall, right? Only the most famous primatologist ever. Inspiration for me, for thousands of other primatologists, for tens of thousands of school kids around the world, right? Um, 
It was her birthday yesterday. Jane turned 80 years old yesterday. I want to play you a little video clip right here introducing you to Jane Goodall. July 14, 1960. 26-year-old Jane Goodall arrives on the shores of Gombe Stream Game Reserve on the coast of what is now Tanzania. When I looked at the wild and rugged mountains where the chimpanzees live, I knew that my task was not going to be easy. She has no field experience or college degree. What she has is determination to observe chimpanzees with a mind uncluttered by conventional scientific methods. When I first came to Gombe to study chimpanzees, I knew nothing about them. Nobody really knew very much about them. She also has the courage to spend months in a remote, even dangerous place getting closer to wild chimps than anyone before her. Now, for those of you of a certain generation, and I would count myself in that generation, your impression of what anthropologists do, your impression of what primatologists do, is probably shaped by films like that or even film strips like that from elementary school. And to a large extent, I have to say, that is an accurate impression of, of how we work. Um, lots of field work in primatology involves just what you've just seen. An intrepid young uh, explorer goes to a tropical place armed with a pencil and a notebook, a pair of binoculars, a poncho to keep the rain off, a lot of patience, maybe a lot of bug repellent, and you spend a lot of time in a tropical forest just looking at things. But in the years since Jane Goodall went to Gombe to study chimpanzees, the study of wild primates has changed quite a bit to incorporate new technologies and new approaches. Um, the place where I work in Ecuador, in South America, is quite a bit different uh, than Gombe. So first off, we're working with an arboreal species, so not a species that's on the ground, uh, like chimpanzees. And it's a more humid tropical environment, poorer visibility. We still use notebooks. We still use pencils and paper. And I think one of my students is out there somewhere about to model for you. I'm looking for Laura. I don't know if I can turn the lights up. Where is she? There we are. So there's Laura in the back there. That's our typical garb for going to the field nowadays. It looks a little bit techy, but there's the rain poncho. So this little image right here of, of an undergraduate that came to the field with us. This was the poor guy's first day in the field and we told him we went in the water. We, re we don't really do that most of the time. <laughs> This is more often what we look like. So, Laura, thank you for modeling that. Thank you. Jay asked if I would wear my poncho to give the talk, but I told him, no, I'd rather, I'd rather do this. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the study site where we work and about how we do our kinds of uh, field work. So the study site where me and my colleagues, Laura and other folks, uh, have been studying spider monkeys and other species of primates for the last 20 years or so is located in the country of Ecuador over here on the northwest coast of South America. Our study site is located in the far eastern corner of Ecuador in a lowland rainforest called the Yasuni National Park. It's a, one of the largest and most pristine national parks, tropical protected areas in South America. Our study site itself is referred to as the Tiputini Biodiversity Station, and it's located on the Rio Tiputini, which is a major tributary of the Rio Napo, which is in turn a major tributary of the Amazon River. So this is primary lowland tropical rainforest. It's in the heart of the Amazon. It's not in the heart of the Amazon basin. It's in the far western edge of the Amazon basin. This is a typical shot of what the forest looks like out over the Rio Tiputini, taken from the veranda of one of the cabins at our field site. Nice, beautiful, contiguous tropical forest. That's what it typically looks like on a sunny day. That's what it typically looks like most of the time. So the same day, a couple of hours later, in the middle of a deluge, there's us, what we typically look like, in the middle of a deluge, coming back from giving up on following monkeys. The monkeys that I'm going to talk about, the spider monkeys, the species that we work with is known as the white-bellied spider monkey, or Ateles belzebeth, but it is only one of a bunch of different primate species that you can find at the site. So I want to take you on a little uh, nature tour through the other species that you find there. There are woolly monkeys, there are sockies, 
There are owl monkeys, a nocturnal primate. Titi monkeys, very, very cute monkey. Howler monkeys, pygmy marmosets, capuchins, squirrel monkeys, and, marmos, uh, and uh, tamarins. So this is an amazingly diverse place in terms of the primate community there. It's an amazingly diverse place in terms of all of the other flora and fauna that you find there as well. Because it's a primary tropical rainforest site, you also have vibrant populations of other things that you'd expect to be in a jungle like that. Things like jaguar uh, and puma, which are potential predators of spider monkeys and other primates. So I'm going to show you another short video clip here in a second. This is a National Geographic video clip. It was filmed at our study site, and it shows just how sensitive spider monkeys are to the risk of predation by jaguars and other big cats. This film is filmed near a mineral lick, which is a site where spider monkeys come down to the ground to feed on mineral-rich clays and drink uh, water at these clay lick sites or mineral lick sites. They are most vulnerable at these places to the risk of predation. And so you're going to see in the video just how sensitive they are as they come down close to the ground. You're also going to get a sense, I think, of the other sights and sounds of the forest. I'd like you to pay particular attention to the spider monkeys. I'm going to point out a couple of things to you about them. Everything here lives in fear of the jaguar, even those that watch from above. Spider monkeys would seem safe. So watch how they use their tails. Every week or so, they go down. This is a juvenile female named Urgy. On the forest floor is a salt lake. Like an oasis in the desert, a salt lake gets a lot of visitors. That's an Amazonian red deer, a parrot. The animals need the mineral rich clay to survive. But the monkeys know the risks. So watch how vigilant she is. Every shadow might conceal a jaguar. Ominous music. There's a little nervous vocalization and branch shake. So something startled them. They got freaked out. They had come close to the ground, but they've gone back up now. There's Lucas. Watch his tongue over here. There he is. So look how awkward they are when they walk on the ground. They don't usually do that. This is an adult female carrying about a year and a half old baby. Now she's like, I'm nervous. Kind of get back on top of me. Watch this. Uh, come on. <laughs> so they all got really freaked out there and they were startled by a group of uh, pigs. Exactly. A group of javelina. The same kind of the same kind of peccaries that we have here. Javelina are, are, are in the in the forest down there. Uh, I almost slipped into Spanish there, Jay. I said it in the bosque down there. So. <laughs> so, you got some really good looks at spider monkeys there, right? You will never, I promise you, ever get a look at a spider monkey like that. Ever again. National Geographic filmmakers that came down to our study site to, to make that film benefited from the six years of habituation that folks like Laura and other of our graduate students uh, have put into getting those monkeys habituated getting them used to people being around. But that's not what it's like for us most of the time. They're not down that close to the forest floor most of the time. So imagine you're trying to find and follow spider monkeys and other monkeys when they're way up in the canopy, 25, 30 meters up. There's a monkey in this picture. That's why it's been up here for so long, just in case any of you noticed that. Anybody see a monkey up there? I think some of you kids from Linder probably know where it is. It's right there. There's a monkey. There's a consternated former graduate student who couldn't find the monkey. 
He did finish his PhD. So in order to be able to find and follow the monkeys, not just spiders, but other uh, kinds of monkeys that we work with as well, we need to capture a couple of them and put radio collars on them so we can track them using technology. And to do this, we shoot them in the butt with a tranquilizer gun. We stand underneath them with a net and we catch them when they fall. Once they're down on the ground, we do a bunch of stuff. We take morphometric data on them. We measure them. We weigh them. And we put one of these things on them. That's a radio collar. It's basically a little transmitter that goes beep, beep. But you can't hear it unless you have one of these, a special radio receiver, a special radio antenna, and a receiver. Once they have that uh, radio collar put on them, we release them, and a field assistant like Anna here can find them and track them using radio telemetry. That lets us map where they go, lets us map how they use space, it lets us find and follow them through the forest, and it lets us spend time with them to habituate them and get them used to being followed around. Once they're habituated, we can follow them without the telemetry, and when we get to that point, we begin doing behavioral observations on them. And we do this in the context of what we call dawn to dusk focal animal follows. What does that mean? We go out really early in the morning, we find a monkey, and we stick with it until it goes to bed at night in a tree. And we go out really early the next day, and we find that same monkey before it wakes up, hopefully, and find it and put it to bed follow it all day and put it to bed again. So that's what I mean by dawn to dusk follows of a single animal. We do this with all of the non-juvenile members of our study groups and all of those individual animals are identifiable by their facial features. And some of you guys who participated in the pre-lecture fair outside had the opportunity to test your hand at recognizing and drawing these individual animals. You can see an animal like Yamonka has this beautiful orange crown and wide white sideburns. Laura, not named after Laura, we named Laura after her, um, doesn't have a big, tall crown, big, colorful crown on her, on her forehead. So when our field assistants first come and start working with us, that's exactly the exercise you do. You draw each of those individuals until you can recognize them from just a glimpse of them. And so you guys, you elementary school kids who participated in doing this, good, you're ready to come in and join us in the field now. Once they're habituated, once we can do these behavioral follows that last all day, there's a couple of standard kinds of data that we collect. We collect data on where they go by carrying a GPS around with us as we follow them and taking location records throughout the day. We keep a record of, who, of how many individuals are associating with the individual that we're following all day. We call that a subgroup composition, and we do that every 15 minutes throughout the day. I mentioned the fissioning and fusing that spider monkeys do, those flexible associations. Well, when a new member joins a subgroup or when somebody splits off from a subgroup, we record the timing of that and, um, and where it's happened and who's participated in it. We record all of the social interactions that involve our focal individuals, aggression, grooming, play, sexual behavior. And we pay careful attention to things like encounters between the monkeys from our main study group and monkeys from other social groups. Spider monkeys are incredibly aggressive to individuals from other social groups. They're very friendly within their own social groups, but they're incredibly aggressive to members of other groups. So we're interested in who participates in that intergroup aggression, where and which group wins, which group loses. Okay, so I'd like to turn now a little bit and focus on that kind of observational data and how we combine it with other kinds of data that are made possible by the use of certain technological, um, new, new technologies, new field methods. Together, these things, I, give us, I think, give us a little bit more insight into certain features of spider monkey social lives that are difficult to get insight into otherwise. So one of the things that I've talked about already is the fact that spider monkeys don't spend their whole day with all of the other individuals in their social group. They're rarely found in the same place at the same time. They do this fissioning and fusing. They do it a bunch of different times a day. They do it in an area that's huge, a big tropical rainforest, about six square kilometers. So how do they do it? Well, one way they might do it is by posting their status so that other individuals can see or hear where they are and decide whether or not to come and be part of a new subgroup, whether or not to come and visit an animal that's posting its status. So a monkey might say something like, I'm hanging out in the fig tree, come on by. This is kind of like if you're posting your status on Facebook and you want your friends to come hang out at the same bar or in the same library cubicle as you. So how do you think they might post this information? Well, 
we think they use that loud, that loud call as a way of updating other individuals about where they are and what they're likely to do. That loud call has characteristics that might make it a good way to post information. It's loud, it carries a really long way through the forest, and it seems to be individually distinctive. It has an acoustic structure that broadcasts information. So to test the idea that spider monkeys might mediate their social relationships at a distance using loud calls, my former graduate student, Steph Spehar, did a really elegant thesis, dissertation work, where in addition to the behavioral data that I've described to you, she did two other things. She took recordings, went out to the field with a high-powered digital microphone uh, and, uh, and a digital recorder. So she recorded the long calls of spider monkeys for spectrographic analysis. And then she took some more detailed behavioral data on how they moved, where they moved, and on changes in subgroup size after they heard and after they gave these loud calls. So I want to play you two example loud calls of spider monkeys, and I want you to listen for the differences between them. See if you can hear a difference. This is a loud call from Poto, and there's a spectrogram associated with that loud call right there. So listen very carefully. Is my impression pretty good? I think it's pretty good. And this is Sammy, a different individual. So there's a difference between those calls. Poto's is much more harmonic. It has a tonal structure to it. And you can see that right here in the spectrogram. It sounds more like this. And Sammy's is much more throaty. It's much rougher sounding. And the spider monkeys can tell that apart. So um, Stephanie demonstrated that they could not only that she could not only discriminate these using a computer, but she did playback experiments where she played the calls of different individual animals back to females in our main social group. She found that females responded very strongly to calls of males, but not calls of females, so they could discriminate the sex of a caller. And, they, and she found they also discriminated and preferred the calls of a particular male and looked at the speaker every time she played those playback calls, those, those uh, vocalizations, and then just kind of ignored a couple of other males. So there's one male that all of the female spider monkeys seem to really like. Stephanie also took detailed data on what transpired after an animal heard a loud call. So she recorded the direction that it moved, whether it approached or avoided a loud call that an individual heard in the distance. And she also recorded whether the size of the subgroup that an animal that heard a call was in increased or decreased after hearing a call. So both males and females, she found, were much more likely to approach rather than avoid or move in a neutral direction relative to a loud call in the hour after they heard that loud call. And she also found that within an hour after hearing a loud call and within an hour after giving a loud call, both um, uh, the, the size of the subgroup that an individual was found in increased. So this is pretty strong evidence that after giving loud calls, after hearing loud calls, the function is for animals to come together and be in groups of larger size. They move towards one another and the size of their subgroups increases. So really good evidence that they coordinate their ranging at a distance using loud call behavior. Okay, so that's the first vignette. I want to tell you a little bit now about spider monkey use of mineral licks. So spider monkeys are one of two species of South American primates that regularly go down and visit these mineral licks that you've seen in the video. You've seen that they act really, really cautiously when they do that. Why they go down to mineral licks isn't really well known, but they are definitely apprehensive uh, when they do it. And they, from our behavioral data, we know that when they go to a mineral lick, they may spend hours in the area before they actually go down to the ground. So they're really super cautious. So here we've, uh, so over the last five years or so, we've been conducting a study of spider monkeys' behavior at mineral licks using camera and video traps. So there's a camera trap. It's basically uh, a heat and a motion sensor attached to a camera. So when it gets triggered by an animal, it takes a bunch of beautiful photographs like that. And the photographs are so good that you can tell who those individuals are. Here's Laura and uh, Andres that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk setting up a camera trap for this study. 
So based on our monitoring of camera traps and video traps over the last five years, we know a fair bit about what the monkeys do when they come down to the ground, which is not something you'd be able to tell otherwise just through behavioral observations because they're so skittish usually when they come to the ground. So we know that they visit mineral licks about one time per week. We know from our behavioral follows that they spend about three hours in the lick area each time they visit. But from the camera trap data, we know that each animal really only goes to the ground for about two minutes after they've been there for a long time. So this has to be something that's really worthwhile for them to do, for them to come and spend such an amount of time before going down to the ground. The other thing that we found that's really interesting based on the camera trap data is that they visit licks in combination with howler monkeys much more often than you would expect by chance. So howler monkeys are the only other species that go to mineral licks, and spider monkeys and howler monkeys tend to show up at licks at the same time. So here's a picture of a couple of different spider monkeys. This is a picture from one of our camera traps, and you can just see the red bottom of a red howler monkey there as well. They showed up with the howler monkey. So the mineral licks are clearly very dangerous areas. This is a recent photo from a camera trap um, in Manu National Park, Peru, that was posted up on Facebook of a young male puma with a tasty red howler monkey uh, in its mouth. So it's clearly a dangerous thing for them to do to come to the ground. And we were curious to see how spider monkeys cope with the risk of predation at mineral licks and how their fission-fusion sociality um, might be related to that. So there's the adage you guys have probably all heard about safety in numbers, right? If you are going to go and do something dangerous, go to a dangerous area, it's good to have other individuals around. Why? Because they can help you look out for possible dangers, predators and such. And two, if that predator is going to attack and be successful, if you're with a bunch of other people, there's a better chance that you're not the individual that gets nailed by that predator. So there's a couple of reasons why you might want to do something dangerous in combination with other individuals. So recall that we track the size of spider monkey subgroups throughout the day as we're following them. That's our subgroup composition records. Well, from our camera trap data, we can also count how many individuals are actually present at a mineral lake when they go down. So we, in this graph, what I've done is I've uh, compared the average subgroup size at different points in the day on days that animals visit mineral licks looking here at when they're at the mineral lick, the start, the middle, and the end of their time that they spend at the mineral lick, subgroup size is very high, and subgroup size increases in a couple of hours as they approach mineral licks. So they're really, the take-home point here is they're really getting together in large groups, much larger groups than you typically see. You very rarely see nine individual spider monkeys together in the same place at the same time. They're getting together in those groups as they're approaching the mineral lick. They're hanging out at the mineral lick in large groups, probably because it reduces their risk of being nailed by a predator, and then they're breaking off into smaller groups as they leave the mineral lick. Okay, third vignette I want to tell you about. Third kind of fascinating behavior about spider monkeys is that same one that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the cooperative boundary patrolling by This behavior, I think, is really especially interesting for those of us who are interested in human behavior because it's another example of the convergence between spider monkeys and our closest non-human primate relative, the chimpanzee, in a very conspicuous, uh, in a very conspicuous manner. Non-human, sorry, chimpanzees do this boundary patrolling behavior as well. Cooperatively, males do it. Um, as early as Jane Goodall's first couple of field seasons, she reported this uh, behavior among the chimps at Gombe. And I want to show you a short video clip here of Jane Goodall introducing uh, us to male chimpanzees performing this boundary patrolling behavior. Whoops. I'll back up. There the males basically patrol the boundaries of the territory and protect the resources from their own females and young. Cameraman Bill Wallauer was amazed when he first saw this patrol behavior. I'll never forget this moment when they all line up on the ridge, 46 chimps, you know, mothers, infants, every male in the community, and scan the hillsides below. And we're high up in the valley, kind of looking down across this range. And they were obviously looking for the enemy. It's just, you know, wow, this is, this is almost like clan warfare from what we read of our ancestors. I mean, it, was just, it was really telling about chimps the way they 
together move as a unit, climbing trees, listening, looking to each other, stop calling. You know, it was a real change in their behavior. That was the first time I ever experienced such a thing. So that kind of conspicuous boundary patrolling behavior and even cases of lethal aggression between males of adjacent communities and chimpanzees have been reported for a couple of chimpanzee study sites in Africa at this point. These are a couple of photographs that were sent to me by a colleague of mine, John Matani, who works with chimpanzees in Uganda, of a bunch of male chimpanzees lining up to go on a boundary patrol. And then on what the result of that boundary patrol was when that set of males encountered a solitary male from an adjacent social group and basically ripped him apart, killed him. Since 2005, in the group of spider monkeys that we've been working with, we've seen about 50 cases of boundary patrols or border patrols or intergroup encounters. And the conditions are very strikingly similar to what you've heard just described. Um, a group of males, maybe with females, but oftentimes just males, will get together. They'll make a beeline towards the edge of their territory, as I described at the beginning of this talk. They'll go outside of their home range. They'll sometimes make an incursion into another group's range. And we think that they are looking for males from other groups to engage with aggressively. We've seen a couple of times where that aggression, where they do encounter males from another group, and that aggression escalates. We think that aggression can be lethal. We've seen males come back from an aggressive encounter between groups with wounds on their legs. And during this period of time between 2006 and 2008, in our main study group, three adult males who were otherwise healthy disappeared during a period of heightened aggression between two communities. So we think the possibility for lethal intergroup aggression is really, really likely. What I've done in this slide is tried to outline, and you've seen this before, the main uh, study group that we work with, which we call MQ1, its home range, and then the home ranges of three adjacent groups. There's a couple of things I want you to get from this, this figure. First off, those home ranges really don't overlap. And in fact, there's some white space here between much of those home ranges. That's an er those are areas where we very seldom see spider monkeys. We call them demilitarized zones between spider monkey communities. They very rarely go there unless they're on a, on a patrol. These dotted lines here represent five separate incidences where males from MQ1 took a boundary patrol or made a raid into another group's territory. And I want to focus in on one of these just for a second uh, and share with you this one right here that occurred on August 7, 2007. I want to share with you field notes from, uh, from Andres Link, my collaborator, what he wrote about this in his field book, old school style, um, when he observed this. So there are some loud calls, long calls around 740, very far north, and five males fission off and sprint in that direction. They move very fast, only stopping to long call. In the far north, another group, MQ3, is also calling. At 820, the males come into a very large tree and they stop. They seem very vigilant, and Juan and Hieronimo, two adult males, are embracing and growling. That's what they do to psych each other up as they're going into an encounter. And they all stare at a nearby emergent tree where three adult males from MQ3 are also resting vigilant and staring towards the MQ1 males. They stare for several minutes. At 840, the MQ3 males retreat back into their home range. So the MQ3 males are outnumbered, five to three. So they turn around and they split. The MQ1 males rest for about 40 minutes and then at 9.22 begin patrolling the southern boundary of MQ3's territories. The males move very silently, only to stop for a couple of minutes to remain completely silent. They actively patrol for about two and a half hours. They go straight into the mineral lick area of MQ3. Their mineral lick is, a, is located right on the edge of their border, uh, where they stop to, uh, and then continue moving further east, where they stop to rest. Only at 1700 do they turn and start moving back into their own territory through that demilitarized zone. So it's a very evocative account, I think, of patrolling behavior. These patrol events, while they're really not that rare, they're still also not that common. We've seen about 50 of them, right? Well, starting a couple of years ago, Andres Link and I uh, decided to conduct a pilot study using technology to see if we couldn't get a better handle on when these boundary patrol events occurred. So we fitted two adult males, Poto, who you've heard me talk about before, right here, and his son, Nenki, with a GPS collar. A GPS collar is basically a radio collar that has a GPS embedded in it as well. Poto's about to wake up here. I hope he's not about to wake up right there, actually. He's asleep. He's just had his GPS collar put on. I'm showing off how big he is here. So that's me kneeling down. He's not as tall as I am, but he's as tall as I am like this. Um, 
Once he's got his GPS collar on and has been released, we can go out and find him with a laptop computer and a special other kind of radio receiver and have Poto send us his GPS data about where he's been. We basically make Poto do our work uh, for us. So in this figure, I have outlined all of the paths that came off of Poto and Nenke's GPS data over a period of about 12 months or about 150 days of sampling. And you can see there are four cases where we're picking up patrols or incursions into other groups' territories using that GPS data. And there are a bunch of other places where he goes into the interstices between ranges. So these data, I think, demonstrate how technology can give us a little bit of handle on uh, and improve our ability to collect certain kinds of behavioral data on these things like rare patrolling events, even in the absence of, the, of actually being with the animals. Okay, my fourth vignette. Save the best for last. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, sexual behavior in spider monkeys and the spider monkey mating system, which is really a bit unusual for uh, non-human primates. As you might imagine, given the poor observation conditions, it's not easy to see spider monkeys engaging in, in mating behavior 20 meters up. This is the, probably the only shot that we have of spider monkeys um, in flagrante delicto. Looks like something you might see on TMZ, right? <laughs> so social, sexual behavior is really hard to see. We've spent about 7,000 hours observing spider monkeys between 2005 and, and roughly the middle of 2011. And we've seen 32, a total of 32 cases of sexual behavior. That's less than five observations per 1,000 hours with the monkeys. If you watch things like baboons or chimpanzees, that rate is orders of mag an order of magnitude higher. Um, there are a couple of things, I think, however, that we can generalize about sexual behavior in spider monkeys from even those few number of cases. We know, first of all, that sexual behavior mostly takes place in the context of consortships. So when a male, a male and a female will fission off from the rest of the members of a community and spend anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of days wandering around on their own and uh, engaging in, in mating behavior. The other thing that we know based on these 32 observations is that there's no aggression between males that occurs in the context of sexual behavior. And in fact, we can discern no dominance hierarchy among the males in this social group. That's very much unlike you would see in other species of primates like baboons or chimpanzees. So this is a situation where there's really minimal overt competition among males. So if we look at those copulations that males engage in, with a set of copulations that we've observed uh, in a bit more detail, this figure kind of summarizes them for you. I'm going to walk you through the figure because you're going to see a couple of others like this in just a second. Here are the names of all of the males who have ever been adults in our main study community, along with the years in which they were present. So the orange bar represents how long they've been present in the group. So Juan was present between 2005 and 2007, Pedro 2005 to 2007, Jeronimo the same. Those were the three males that disappeared in that period of escalated aggression I was talking about. And then each of these numbers represents the number of copulations that we've seen each of those males doing. So we've seen Poto copulate one time, Sandy copulate four times in 2008, three times in 2009, and so on. The far right-hand column summarizes the number of different females that we've seen those males mating with. So a couple patterns emerge here. Six of the nine adult males, the males who were ever adult in our study group, were seen mating at some point in time. We never saw sub-adult males mating. So Mono, Andreo, and Nenki are three sub-adult males who became adults. They didn't mate at all until they were adults. And then all of the males that were seen to mate more than once mated with more than one female. Sammy mated eight times with four different females. Lucas six times with three different females, and so on. If you flip that on its head, and look at the same copulations, the same data from the female perspective. Again, here are all the females who have ever been adults in our main study group. When we've seen them mating and the number of different males they mated with, all of the times that we've seen females mating more than once, they've mated with more than one male. So this really paints, our behavioral observations paint a picture where both males and females are mating with multiple members of the opposite sex. We call that free love. <laughs> But the small, that small number of observations really isn't enough to be able to make any solid conclusions about the mating system of spider monkeys, right? We need other approaches, and modern genetic technologies allow us to directly examine patterns of parentage using wildlife forensic techniques. So if we can get DNA from animals, 
then we can see who actually reproduces with whom. The trick is to do this non-invasively without having to capture more than is absolutely necessary. To do that, we take advantage of a tenet of evolutionary biology. Everyone poops. Poop contains a lot of DNA. It's got DNA from all of the things you've eaten, from your gut bacteria, and from your the inside of your own intestine. And so if we can get a poop sample from a spider monkey, we can genotype it and we can do a paternity test. Getting DNA was pretty di out of poop was pretty difficult up until about 10 years ago. Now it's fairly routine. We do have a complicated technical protocol for sampling poop. That's our complicated technical protocol. Alternatively, we rob a bolus of poop from a dung beetle. We put it in a little tube. Oh, right. It inspires our field assistants to have poop haiku contests. Oh, spider monkey is swinging through the forest trees. May I have your poop? It identifies uh, yeah, our, our colleagues make up silly puns in their journal titles, identifying species from pieces of feces. All right. So our genetic data set, we bring the poop back to Texas, hook them. Uh, we extract DNA here and then we do a DNA fingerprint. Um, basically for each of the poop samples that we get. For those of you guys who watch CSI and you hear them talking all the time about CODIS, the combined DNA index system, that's what we do basically. Uh, and then how does it work? Well, we get a poop sample from a female named Anna, for example, a poop sample from a little kid that hangs out with her, Annika. We do a genotype for each of those individuals. We make sure that Annika is really Anna's kid. And then we compare all of the males present in our main study group and in those adjacent groups to see which males could possibly have sired Annika. It's like a who's your daddy paternity test for monkeys. You do that, 20, we've done that for 28 kids born between 1998 and 2011. This is before we started working with the group because we sampled animals as juveniles and subadults beginning in 2005. And we see that a bunch of different males within the group all sire kids. So if we take a look at paternities from the same, in the same kind of uh, setup that I, we looked at copulations with, Six of the nine males who were ever adults in this uh, study period sired offspring. They almost always sired those offspring with different females. So Juan had five kids with five different females. Pedro, three kids with three different females. Poto, seven kids with seven different females. Flip at it and look at it from the female side. Almost all of the female's kids are sired by different males. So again, monkey free love. It's an egalitarian mating and reproductive system. Males are siring kids with different females. Females are siring kids with different males. We know this from being able to use genetic data in the absence of very many observations about what's going on with respect to mating. Okay, so just to, to give you a couple of closing remarks and then we'll open it up for some questions. I've mentioned a couple of times through this talk the really remarkable parallels between spider monkeys and chimpanzees in certain aspects of their behavioral biology, of their mating systems, their social systems, their ecology. I want to remind you that chimpanzees and spider monkeys shared a common ancestor a really long time ago. There's been 72 million years of independent evolution between those two lineages of, of primates or groups of primates. So of the 250 plus different species of primates, chimpanzees and spider monkeys share a bunch of these features of their evolutionary biology. Fission fusion associations. Chimps, like spider monkeys, have distinctive loud calls, the pant hoot. If I were Jane Goodall, I'd do a pant hoot for you. I can't do one because she's the master. Um, but they, those also modulate and coordinate social interactions at a distance. Chimps have large home ranges, like spider monkeys, with little overlap between groups. Female dispersal and patrilineality characterizes chimpanzees. Cooperative territorial defense and these boundary patrols that males uh, engage in, also common in chimpanzees. So for me as an anthropologist, someone who's interested in human behavior, it means that even though spider monkeys are very distant rel relatives of chimpanzees and of modern humans, they still may make very good models or analogs for studying some of the factors that underlie certain aspects of chimpanzee and presumably early human sociality. Features like these very flexible associations, female dispersal and marriage with other with individuals from other social groups, male bonding, patrilineality, cooperative range defense, cooperative male aggression, and so on. So on that note, let's have the, the slides up. I mean, sorry, the lights up if we could. And I'll step forward to say thank you very much to all of you guys. Jay, ESI.
thank you guys very much for listening. There is nothing I like to do more than to blab on about spider monkeys. So please, if you have questions, I'd be really happy to entertain them. Okay. Questions for Professor Yes, young man. That's a great question. So the question is, do the spider monkeys ever grab the tracking collar and try to do something with it, like take it off? And yes, immediately after waking up, once they get kind of no longer groggy, they climb up into a tree and they sit there and then they realize, oh, I've got something on and they start tugging at it. And they do that for about 15, 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes. This happens with radio collars. It happens with the GPS collars. All the monkeys do it. After about that time, they stop doing it. And, and don't pay any more attention to it. They do get them off sometimes, not commonly. The spider monkeys can't get the GPS collars off. The other monkeys can get the ball and chain collars that we put radios, radio transmitters on off sometimes. Yes, young lady. Sorry. But you like monkeys. No. You can tell me your story after, afterwards. I'll come and find you. You can tell me your story afterwards, okay? How about another question? What's that? Okay. Yeah. What's the average age of a spider monkey? That's a really good question. It's hard to know. It's, in fact, hard to know how long they live for. In captivity, they'll live for about 30, 35 years. We think Poto is the oldest male in our study group, and we estimate that he's got to be at least about 28 years old because of when he sired his first kid, which was a long time ago, and they have to be about six or seven years old before they were, are able to be the dad of a kid. Um, but we don't know how long they live on average. It's a really good question. Wish I did. Yeah. Where do they sleep? So if they stay on the ground for, for some period of time, they do come down to the ground. Where do they sleep? They sleep way up in the top of tall trees. Um, sometimes they sleep by themselves up there. Sometimes they sleep with other spider monkeys. There are a couple of sites, Laura would know many of them, where they all, where, where more than one individual tend to congregate, and those are repeatedly used sleeping sites. But they don't always sleep, sleep in the same place every night. They, all, they usually don't. And the whole group does not sleep together. They split up into these different subgroups and, and sleep very, in de very different places. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the question is about female dispersal. When females reach sexual maturity, when they're approaching sexual maturity, they begin to spend less time with their moms and eventually we don't see them anymore. And they move, they presumably move into other communities. We don't see where they go. We had a radio collar on a female that was a, a, of dispersal age. It went out of our, she left and went out of radio collar range. So we don't know how far they go. The only animals that we ever see coming into our communities are females. So they're coming from, from outside, usually when they're sub-adult age. Yes. So most of those, all of those juveniles are still alive. There's, I think, two or three individuals, actually all but one of them are still alive. There are two or three individuals um, that we have not been able to sample from and that disappeared before we, we got a sample from. So there's probably about 30 or 31 that were born in that period. There are others that have been born since 2011 that are not yet big enough to have a big enough poop sample, you know, their, their poops aren't big enough for them to fall all the way down from up in the canopy for, so we can sample and, and see who their, their parents are. Um, how does that compare to the size of the community? Well, the size of the community, if you count the juveniles, uh, sorry, if you count only the adults, there's about six or seven fully adult males, two or three sub-adult males, and about 11 or 12 adult females 
in the group at any given point in time. The juveniles, as they get older, they, they join those ranks of the adults, but the female ones move. Yeah. So we, we don't know. We've never seen a male transfer into our social group, and we've been working with them now for the last ten, uh, nine years or so. We have seen females come in as young adults or as old sub-adults. Um, whether they transfer as adults, I don't think we know. There are other closely related primates, woolly monkeys, where females do transfer as adults, um, and they may transfer between groups multiple times during their lifetime. We have seen a couple of cases where a female spider monkey will come into our community, be seen for a couple of months, and then move on. So we think that they may go and check out different communities, find one where they can get along with the individuals who are there, and stick around there. How about a, a question in the back? Yes. Has any of the monkeys died? So we don't, it's very rare to find a body of a monkey in a tropical forest. Why? Because when they die, there are all these other critters around that'll come in and eat them. They get eaten, the body gets eaten very, very quickly. There are monkeys that have disappeared from our study groups, and we presume that they're dead. There's one case where we have found a dead woolly monkey because it had a radio collar on it and it was still transmitting a mortality signal. So when the collars don't move for 24 hours, the tone changes, or the rate at which the, the transmitter beeps changes. That's called a mortality signal. And so if it hasn't moved in a long time, that's an indication that either the monkey has dropped its collar, and plenty of those have happened, or that an animal is dead. And we've gone and been able to recover one dead woolly monkey that way, but no spider monkeys. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, we've only ever seen them interacting aggressively in that way with other spider monkeys. So within that spider monkey home range, there are, you can find any of those other ten species, uh, the other nine species of primates. You'll sometimes see spider monkeys and woolly monkeys feeding in the same trees. You'll sometimes see spider monkeys and capuchins feeding in the same trees. There's a little bit of competition that goes on in that the larger bodied monkeys may chase some of the smaller bodied monkeys away. But we don't think there's the kind of, um, to use an anthropomorphic term, warfare that goes on between species as goes on within the species. Yeah. Are the monkeys ever angry at us or other humans and attack them? Um, I will say a qualified no. Why do I mean a qualified no? So right after they're waking up from being... Um, from being anesthetized, they don't exactly know exactly what they're doing. So they're, we put them in a recovery cage. They, we let them wake up to be sufficiently animated that they can climb up in a tree. We've had a couple of cases, one case in particular, where we released an animal too early, and it started to go up in a tree and then wasn't able to get up all the way, and so we recaptured it or tried to recapture it and put it back in a recovery cage. He bit the heck out of my finger, bit all the way through my finger. I still have my finger, so it, it healed pretty well. That's the one time that we've ever been attacked by a monkey. Uh, so normally, they don't pay any attention to us, especially after they've been habituated for a while. The small monkeys that we work with, TD monkeys, sockies, don't pay any attention to us at all. The spider monkeys and woolly monkeys will look down at us sometimes. Look down at us. That, they're, they, they're, they're literally looking down at us, right? Because they're hanging up. Above. Um, sometimes the juveniles will shake branches at us, and they're, they're, they're kind of like a play gesture. So it's usually when their mom's sleeping, they're kind of bored. They'll hang upside down by that prehensile tail and go, oh, 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 and try to engage, we think, try to engage us. But no aggression from them, generally. Yeah. What are the big differences between spider monkeys and other primates? Great question. There's lots of primates that don't live in the, in the new world, like spider monkeys do. 
The big difference between spider monkeys and most other primates is spider monkeys have that prehensile tail, although they do have some relatives that also have a prehensile tail. What else did you guys notice about spider monkeys? They have really long arms and really long legs, right? So that very lanky body is something that's characteristic of spider monkeys. Spider monkeys practice a form of locomotion called brachiation. So they do this suspensory locomotion. They use their tail as well when they're doing that. Most other primates don't do that. Yeah. Yes. Do pumas, monkeys, jaguars, or any other animals, I imagine, ever attack the trail cameras? No, they don't attack them, but sometimes they, you'll, you'll see a, a, a picture of an animal that's gotten right up close to it, like it's sniffing it, and then the flash goes off and the animal kind of looks like this in the picture. <laughs> there are a couple of pictures that have come out of another camera trap study of uh, where, where peccaries have kind of scratched themselves or back upside uh, against one of the cameras. So yeah, I'd encourage you, there's a, there's a great video um, that uh, I would encourage you to look up called Amazon Symphony. And I think, Laura, do you know where, where Diego's video is posted? What, it's, uh, is it on Zimeo? So if you look on the, on the Facebook page for the Tiputini Biodiversity Station, you should be able to find it. It's a, vi it, it's a, uh, a beautiful set of video trap um, videos that have peccaries in it, puma, parrots, a sloth, spider monkeys, howler monkeys, capybara, all sorts of cool animals, videos of cool animals, and it's set to beautiful music, too. Yeah. Have male monkeys ever acted like dads before? Well, spider monkeys don't give a lot of paternal care, so they don't do a lot of stuff with kids. But some of the other monkeys in South America, the titi monkeys in particular, those males are really good dads. So male titi monkeys live in a socially monogamous group. There's a male and a female, and they have a couple of kids, usually a couple, you know, one year, and then they have a kid the next year. Those dads are super invested in their offspring. They carry their kids around from a couple of weeks after birth. They're the primary caregivers. The kid only pops over onto mom to nurse. And basically then when she's done nursing, she goes like this and says, get off me, go hang out with your dad. And, and the kids are actually, there have been studies in captivity, those kids are actually physiologically more bonded to their dads than to their moms. So this is the kind of experiment you might be able to do in captivity if you were this kind of primatologist. I'm not. But you could put a kid in a Y maze with its mom and its dad and it prefers to go over to the, the side where dad is. They do not have kids with other monkeys, only spider monkeys. No hybridization. Yeah. How do I, you might know the answer to this because you were there, I think, when I talked with, at Linder. We have thousands of monkey poop samples. So you know, if, if you ever want to see a lab full of monkey poop, freezers full of monkey poop, two blocks away, about three or 4,000 DNA uh, uh, monkey poop samples, right? What's that? Has anything ever attacked me? The, the worst thing that's attacked me has been these things called bullet ants. So bullet ants, yeah, their name kind of really says it all. Um, they're about this big, about the size of a big bullet, right? And they hurt like a bullet um, when you get stung or bitten by them. But we've all been attacked by them. They're yeah, not that bad. Yeah. Why are spider monkeys called spider monkeys? Ooh, I think you might have stumped me. I'm guessing it's because they have those really long arms and because when they're hanging on lianas, they kind of look like they're a spider in a web. But that is a fantastic question. And I'm going to have to look up the answer to that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a really good question, and, and I don't have a good answer for it. Um, certainly, most of the patrols have, have several of the males in them, but there's not like there's a single male that goes on all of the patrols. Um, so I, I don't know how they coordinate in the absence of a leader. 
that said, you know, lots of, lots of humans do things in the absence of a leader, and you can have a different leader in different kinds of situations, right? So it may be that a patrol this day, Lucas is feeling particularly uh, gung-ho to go out and look for some males to beat up from another group. It might be on a different day that Poto is, is wanting to go and visit the, edge of the other edge of the territory. Sometimes when they make these incursions into other territories, it really seems like they're going for resources that they know about in those other territories. So there's one long incursion that went up to the northwest side. You probably won't remember it, but what, when most of the group actually went out of uh, the MQ-1 range, they went straight to a mineral lake that was in another group's site. Laura was there when, when this happened. I wasn't there when it happened, but I, I think, if, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they basically made a beeline towards that other mineral lake. We had never been there before. We'd spent thousands of hours following those monkeys, and we'd never been there before. There was a female actually leading that day, correct, Laura? And so we suspect that maybe she was a female that knew where it was, and everyone was following her, because she had come in from that other territory. But that's speculation. Yeah. That's a really good question. So the question is, what are they getting? Why do they go to the mineral licks? Why do they eat clays? There's a couple of different hypotheses. One is that it might serve as kind of a, a detoxification kind of thing. Like if you eat something that upsets your stomach and you have to take Pepto-Bismol or milk of magnesia, something to bind up the tannins that uh, might be present in some of the foods that you're eating. That's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis is that they're getting some kind of mineral sodium or potassium that they don't get enough of in their normal diet? Really good question, though. Very good minds are working on that. There's no answer. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. The most grossest thing I've ever examined? Is that? <laughs> we, we found a squirrel monkey body once that was in a pretty advanced stage of decomposition. I would venture to say that's about the grossiest thing we've ever examined. Yes, over here. How about you? Do they have a certain kind? They have lots of different kinds of fruits they like to eat. I think I mentioned they eat about 250 different kinds of fruits. There's about 20 that they really like. There's one that I particularly like that's called mango de monte, which has a kind of a mango-y taste. So yeah, they, they, we do think that they probably have a chance of getting attacked when they're patrolling, which is probably why they get together when they go on those patrols. And so you, you see a bunch of males doing it together. There's that kind of safety in numbers that they would have by doing it together. So, yeah. Uh, last question for Professor. How about you, Kilani? Do they try out new fruits? And it, I, I don't know. I think they probably do. I think kids probably learn what are good fruits to eat from watching their parents. So you saw that spider monkey baby that the mom was trying to push back onto its back, right? Well, those kids spend the first couple of years of their lives generally either on mom or very, very close to mom. And so they can see all the things that mom's eating. And when mom puts something in her mouth, kids often come over there and try to bite it and see what it's like. They're like, mom, what are you eating? Um, so we think they learn, probably learn a lot about what's safe to eat from interacting with their parents and from seeing other spider monkeys eat things. So, uh, and, oh yeah, I have a last question. Sure. You mentioned that there's one of these spider monkeys that all the females answer his calls. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a great question, Jay, and, and that was part of Stephanie's dissertation to try to figure out what it was. Um, he was he was a central male, so what it, what that meant was that lots of the other individuals in the group liked to hang out with him. The other males liked to hang out with him. The females liked to hang out with him. Um, we don't know what it was about him. He did not. Um, he was not more successful than any of the other males at parentage. Right? So he didn't, he didn't have more kids than the other males, but they attended to his calls more. And so he, did, he had more dates. And the way that Steph did this, it was really, you know, she, it was impressive. She went around the forest with this big, giant speaker and waited till the conditions were perfect for doing a playback when the animals weren't looking at her. 
she kind of concealed the speaker and she'd play the long call and then uh, record the direction that they looked and how long it took them to look at the speaker. So it was a, you know, it's a, a challenging set of experiments to do in a field environment. I have a couple of quick announcements here. And after we're done, I'm sure Tony would be happy to hang out and answer your questions individually. First announcement is, so in uh, Boston Music Art, we have one here. Second announcement is, right after this, we're going to be doing a grappling of your prizes. But I also want to announce that we have a prize for Tony for all the effort he's put to make such an amazing talk. It's a monkey card game. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. <laughs> yeah. What kind of what? So there are literally two thousand some different kinds of trees that you can find in the tropical forest like that. There's some that are pretty common, um, but I don't think the spider monkeys have any preferred kind of tree. They go in all of them. They like tall trees. They spend most of their time up pretty high. Thanks for your question. Hey, how are you? Three, four, seven, two, six, two. Thank you. 